Hello and welcome to another episode of Mashable Pakistan Lab. Today we have with us Beenish Tahir from UNDP. And in a few minutes, you will get to know why she is here and what sort of interesting inf information she has to share with you guys. So hello and welcome, Beenish. Thank you for having me. So let's just dig in and I'll start with uh, you personally. Uh, just share a bit about your uh, you know, professional arc so that people understand what you are doing in your current position, and then we can take it from there. Thank you. Um, so I have been working in international development for about now 12 years or so. It's more than that. Um, I started from uh, working in a local NGO, the Rural Support Program Networks, uh, and then eventually moved on to International Rescue Committee and other international NGOs. Um, my background training is in sociology and then in social policy. And because I wanted to get into the policy world more, um, I joined the UN. Uh, so that's kind of the long story short of why the UN. And here at the UN, I have actually a very non-traditional job. Um, it is a very new area of work that is emerging. Um, I head the Innovation Accelerator Lab. Um, one thing I need to clarify is that often we get confused for a startup incubator or an accelerator. We are not that. <laughs> we work with startups. But maybe more, I can say, from the demand side. Uh, startups play an extremely important role in our work, and we can go into that later. But essentially, what my what my lab does, along with my team that I work with, um, we are here to test new ways of doing development. Uh, there has been a lot of issues in the way we're working in development programming, and we need to change how we do that. Um, and the nature of um, development challenges are becoming more and more global and more fast paced, COVID being an example. So how can we better address these complex problems is where the lab comes in. And that's what we always, um, what we're trying to explore uh, at UNDP. Yeah, so you sort of um, already opened up to my next uh, question. And that was because UNDP is seen as an international organization, develop, it's a developing uh, programs, but it has a different feel when the name is said. People have a very different idea. It's not something that people associate with an incubator or an accelerator. And as you rightly said, and specifically as the name suggests, people have this idea because, you know, uh, startups and you know getting them involved incubating them accelerating them is something that's sort of the in thing now so everybody's first impression is that uh, maybe UNDP is sort of you know uh, divulging into that segment of uh, development as well so just add more to what you just uh, hinted on uh, how do you guys operate just basic introduction because you already said that you guys deal with the demand side of this development sector uh, issue and looking for ways to you know do things differently. So just a bit more about what uh, your unit does specifically, and also uh, in, uh, a bit more localized version of it and how it's uh, being doing in Pakistan. So we have. Uh, so I can. You know, through the examples of our work, I can explain a bit better uh, about what we're doing. So, for example, we have one uh, one portfolio of our work is on plastic waste and circular economy. Um, and so, in this 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 program started from uh, the government's ban on plastic bags, but research indicates that banning is not really the most effective policy solution because you probably saw now there's other more harmful uh, bags that are being used instead of bags, right? So this becomes an issue of a system. Um, if you only look at one solution, you start addressing that. That's, that's what we call a linear program or policy design. 
we need to look at the larger system. And I think startups are very good at looking at that. Startups are there to look into the future and create new ideas, uh, new approaches. And they can't do that by just looking at one problem. They look, they have a kind of 3D, three-dimensional view of the issue. Um, so similarly, um, you know, for the plastic ban, we started using a system approach, which is basically looking at the big picture. Uh, and to field test it. So we, we are different from a think tank. We're not just researching, we're also testing the development program itself. And now um, we're working with Unilever uh, to test different economic models and a different economic model for plastic waste. And we're doing it also in partnership with startups. Um, we're running innovation challenges. We're trying to see through them because it is really through them we are seeing innovative solutions. So that is kind of an example of how we work with a startup, looking at their solutions and bringing it into our development programming while looking at a larger problem. And through this experiment, we hope to be able to demonstrate a circular model, um, you know, uh, and, and, and a circular model that could sort of and I don't know what that looks like exactly. That's the beauty of the lab. We're not sure of the answers, um, but that circular model, which is profitable also for um, the informal uh, community, as well as private sector and for government, uh, could be a policy model we could demonstrate. Um, so wait for that, check out our website as we get more and more answers. We uh, will be launching our uh, website that um, shows all the our plastic portfolio program. So I hope that clarifies a little bit of what we do. Yeah, it does, and it's it's interesting the approach that you have explained because not just for the specific uh, issue that you used as an example, which was pl uh, plastic bags. But generally, I think in the developing sector, um, not just in Pakistan but around the world, I think we really really need to rethink how we want to go about it because the current model currently is not reaping the results. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of, there's a book, I've, I'm also looking for it. It's like too much aid, but too less development. And I think a lot of money is going into these projects, but we are not seeing the, you know, the uplift, the human, the uplift of the human cost and everything that, that everybody wants to achieve from these. Um, so um, when I was doing some research and I asked you guys to send over some, you know, some details of how the system works, there was an interesting bit that I want you uh, to just talk about a bit more. And I think you have touched upon the exploration and the experimenting side of it, but there are three things that you guys said that there are three ways that you do your projects and the three things that you want to, you know, uh, sort of benchmarks or three things that basically any any project that you guys do these are the three things that you do time and again and to see and test them across so one as you said was exploration and then there was experimentation but there was also solution mapping so just talk about how do are they done in the the said order uh, or they can be switched or how each uh, segment has its impact on whatever project that you are trying to or, or issue that you are trying to solve? So that's an interesting question. Uh, I like that you have asked about the sequencing because this needs to be addressed. Um, so of course, you know, everything starts with an exploration uh, and then, you know, will result in experimentation. But solution mapping is quite, um, so, you know, in, in our lab, the, 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 there are three core team members and there is somebody who's the head of solution mapping in my team. And then there's the head of experimentation. And so um, it's, we use these terms largely to do different things, um, but solution mapping is also kind of exploration. Uh, so in our team, uh, basically our solution mapping expert is constantly looking out for solutions, innovative solutions from, let's say, the startups. Um, and that is as, a, you know, this can be done through looking what's out there as the projects happen. 
uh, to looking into the future five, 10 years from now, what those solutions can be using strategic foresight methodology. Uh, so you, you start um, using that approach. Or it could be looking at jagards, you know, like from the community in your in Raja Bazaar. So there's a particular activity my colleague Javeria, who heads this, does, which is called uh, Solution Safaris, where you kind of go into, let's say, um, the Sunday market and uh, you just look around very closely and see what are the innovative solutions people have, have done. Like maybe they're drinking, they're keeping their water coolers cool in a certain way, or um, they are, I don't know, doing social distance in certain ways, who knows. But the idea is, is that the solutions that we find out there, we bring them back into our programming. Uh, and, and we need to work very collaboratively, not just with our government and uh, communities, et cetera, but, but find those solutions rather than assuming. That's the big part of what we mean by innovation for development. We don't go in assuming we know the answer. Traditionally, development programs make very big assumptions on what the solutions would be so that they can justify the logical framework aid framework is to justify to donors exactly where money has been spent because the constituents of these countries need to know where every cent has gone um, that has that results in issues of accountability uh, towards the community often the community gets lost and often we miss the local solutions our approach is we, like I said, with the circular economy model, we don't know what we're going to find. We have some assumptions that we're testing and we're trying to test all of them. And we're trying to do it collaboratively with startups, government, private sector and development expertise and, and move in an agile way so that we can keep up with the pace also. Yeah, I think uh, you sort of uh, hit the nail right where I think the issue with the current developing se uh, sector issue is because I think a lot of things are done on paper and then uh, they're implemented and with the expectation that the results that we thought of in our heads and wanted on our papers just materialize without actually considering the, the practical ground realities. Uh, so I know that this, uh, this initiative of UNDP uh, is comparatively new and not just in Pakistan, but overall, I think it started in 2013 or 14. Uh, so comparatively to the, the overall organization, this is a pretty new uh, initiative. But since you guys have started, would you like to share any success stories or any initiative highlights that you guys have achieved that you would like the rest of us to know so that we can see what what you guys have been up to? Well, um, there, there are actually two phases of this um, program. I mean, so it was overall at UNDP innovation work did start around 2014, but it came to Pakistan in 2017. So yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is recent. Um, at first, it was just me. <laughs> Uh, and that was one phase. And then in the last, uh, since 2019, we have this team. And so UNDP in, I think now 90 countries has opened accelerator labs. And in these accelerator labs, um, there are, you know, people from the startup world, research world, you know, creative world, designers, etc. So it's very exciting um, team composition. Now, in this particular phase, I would like to, I think it's more relevant for your audience if I discuss some of the learnings in since the lab actually started with the team in 2019. Um, look, the projects, the, the main lesson is, is that if you want to do, wait, let me go one more step back. When we talk about innovation, what does that mean? You know, what are we really talking about in the development world? I, I would very much like to clarify this. Innovation is not just technology. You know, it is, it is about doing things differently, uh, whether it's thinking out of the box or finding that jagad, whatever, but finding more effective, impactful ways of doing development work. 
um, there's a lot of room for improvement, like just like what you had discussed earlier, the research that you had done about more aid, etc. These are linear designs that are harmful um, to our development programming. It's also harmful for our policy design. Um, so this is what we mean by innovation, right? Just simply doing things better, <laughs> finding new ways and doing them better. Okay. And then in the space, in this development space, we always advocate that if you want to do innovative programs, you can't just hire a startup. You can't just run an innovation challenge. Uh, you have to design your process differently in the first, first space. If your design is innovative, you will yield innovative results. You know, you will come upon solutions that you did not realize were possible, but you have to be curious. So this brings me to my final major learning outside of the programming. And I think this is very relevant for, for the startups and entrepreneurs. The team that you have, um, the team that you have is extremely important. And, you know, uh, running that team creatively is extremely important. Having curious and knowledgeable people are extremely important um, in your in your world and in your space. Okay, so you basically um, you're talking about the learnings that you have mentioned, uh, one of the key things that you mentioned about the fact that you know a team is really important and i think uh, that stands true not just for the developing sector startups but anywhere be it any sort of uh, business activity that you want to do hell i think it in, in life in general i think uh, so um talking about the examples that you have uh, guys been experimenting with another thing that i've learned uh, before we I was, while, while i was prepping for this podcast and that was something that was really, really interesting for me. And that was that you guys tried uh, doing interviews in GB over SMS. So during the COVID, finally, somehow with a heavy heart or I don't know with what, finally, everybody thought and found ways to be OK with a virtual uh, you know, environment where they had to actually work uh, for a even if it was for a short while from home and you know they sort of equipped them, themselves from all sort of relevant tools. So I can understand that uh, people uh, have now finally figured out or got a hang of you know what video interviews mean and that they are equally good. But just give some details of how you guys managed interviews via SMS and what was the response and specifically in a prov in a region of the country where it's considered that you know the internet services are not really that good thank you for that question that was um i think this was a very uh this was our pivot stage of our program um so this is um so this is a new approach we are piloting. It's called the Social Innovation Platform Approach. And on the UNDP Pakistan Innovation website, um, everyone can learn more about it. But in some, there is a stage which is called the deep listening stage. And this is meant to be ethnographic. We are meant to go into the field. We know we're trying to understand the socioeconomic response. Um, and in that case, it wasn't meant to be for COVID. It was meant to be able to understand the socioeconomic kind of dynamics and the needs uh, for programming there. So we had no idea what we were going to program for. It had to come from the community. It had to come from the stakeholders. And we had to immerse ourselves into the community to get those answers. And then COVID happened. So we could not travel, of course. Um, and as you mentioned, internet connections are very poor. Um, that is why we use mobile phones um, and the SMS service. And we have done this in previous um, uh, UNDP programming programs also. And I must mention the partner actually that made this possible was a company called Viamo. Uh, it's a Canadian based company, Viamo, which has its office here in Pakistan. And they have helped us in um, 
uh, reaching communities through SMSs many times before. And um, I think they have uh, call centers that they have partnerships with, they have partnerships with Telenor and Jazz, et cetera. So um, they are, they're specialized in, in reaching communities through SMSs. Um, and in this case, they did exactly what they, they are very good at, which I think through call centers were reaching out to communities and sending questions and sort of that um, the survey questions essentially that were being sent out, we were getting responses and they were analyzing that. And this analysis was done also in partnership with the, with the organization ALC based in Spain that has actually uh, designed this social innovation platform approach. Um, but we have found, and it is, and statistics back this up in Pakistan, SMS, um, is widely used. Mobile phones are widely used. Um, but I'm going to say this, do not assume that women are using this phone. Uh, it's usually one phone per household, so we have to be careful. Um, but it is our best way. Um, there is, we cannot rely on the internet alone, especially to reach rural communities. True. Um, so uh, you mentioned previously about the fact that you know, uh, no one organization or one unit or one startup or even bigger, uh, well-established organization can actually, you know, find solutions for everything. And there needs to be a more uh, collaborative approach towards uh, our work, specifically when it comes to the developing sector. So, can you share how you go about these collaborations? How do you find partners? Um, is there a way if somebody has an idea, how do they get to approach you? Or are you guys actively looking for partners? Uh, for, are they project specific, idea specific? How do you go about that? So um, our work is deeply inclusive and collaborative. You know, for us, um, we are always on the lookout for partners and we are in particularly looking out for what our innovation colleague in uh, the global office, Julio, calls the mutants. Uh, <laughs> the mutants being these people who are out there, super creative, super interesting ideas. So it doesn't matter if you are a designer, artist, writer, um, a finance guy, whoever, you know, um, we are always on the lookout for people and companies or organizations who are looking to change the world and have a big idea. Um, now, look, we aren't investors. We don't have that kind of grant. So that is not what we can really help. But we want to create a platform this is where our ecosystem work is coming in this is our priority for 2021 as we start advocating for innovation for development work and we're going to be um, holding uh, webinars uh, every month and we will have one you know next month and, and this month also uh, next month um, so keep uh, to keep up to date, tune in to the UNDP Pakistan website where we advertise everything we're doing. Um, and also on our UNDP pages, uh, there are email addresses uh, that you can reach out to. You can reach out to me on my Twitter, uh, to my team on Twitter. All three of us are on uh, Twitter. So, um, you know, I mean, you can contact me at Beanish with a C and reach out. Uh, so just reach out to us. They're, all channels of communication are open. If you're looking to change the world and Pakistan, reach out to us. Um, and uh, we will find a way to connect in, in, some, in some way if we can and if it's aligned with our portfolio or maybe we would call you on to a webinar that we would like to uh, have you feature on. Um, but it's very important to actively reach out. What often happens to us is people um, contact us and ask us, what are we doing? <laughs> and that's not the best approach <laughs> because nobody really has time to now write a long email to explain what you're doing. It's much better if you have already read, everything is on our UNDP Pakistan Innovation website, everything you're doing. Um, just read that and if you find a you find something that we're not doing right or you have something to contribute, 
write to us exactly. I have an idea for your circular economy portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, due diligence in research, prior research before reaching out to you guys. That, and that's, I think, uh, a good message. Uh, before I uh, move on to a couple of social media questions that we've got uh, for you, my last question would be, are, what are your future plans or do you guys, and by future plans, uh, again, not a very generic, uh, I'm not asking a very generic bigger plans, but with this uh, initiative, do you have any like long-term goals that you have set, or are you guys uh, at the top for the time being just experimenting and going with the flow? Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I really like your questions. <laughs> They're very <laughs> good ones. Uh, so for us, we the lab has um, started with a vision. Uh, which is we want to demonstrate there that there are better ways of doing development. So new approaches, methodologies. Number two, that these methodologies are yielding systemic changes. So we're looking at the global problem and also the and what the impact is locally. Think climate change, think COVID. How can we design uh, programming that is systemic? that can create transformations that are systemic. So again, going back to the plastics portfolio, we are basically, our economies are designed in an extractive way. You know, we make, there's a lot of waste and leakage into the environment. How do we move the economy towards circularity where there is no waste, like mother nature, right? Mother nature never wastes. How do we get from this point to that point? This is what I mean by systemic change. And we are trying to demonstrate from our portfolios that we can, we want to get there. Um, we also, um, so, so that is another area. And then uh, finally, we also want to start um, building a community of, uh, I, I briefly mentioned this, we, I want, we want to build a community of practice with startups, with the mutants, uh, with the development community as well as the donors of how can we come together and, 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 and design innovative programs for greater impact? How do we work with new partners like the partners in the startup community? Um, and then finally, uh, a, a plan that uh, is, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to deliver a new service offer on um, strategic foresight which is going into the future, trying to understand what is happening in the future policy-wise and reverse, almost reverse engineering to today. So future of work, you know, what are the jobs that are going to be in 2055? And so should the government today be investing in vocational training in like, as, a, as a car mechanic? What if this job is automated? Then what do you do? You know, so that's another service line we're trying to um, to start. So these are a few things. Ultimately, the big vision is is that we want to demonstrate that this is possible. And how do we do that? Uh, fingers crossed. Maybe in another year you have more more insight. That's our plan. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's really interesting. And this reverse engineering thing that you mentioned, I think that can also help. Uh, maybe if somebody is listening, help our education system because we are matching the you know the professional requirements and uh, practical requirements to what we are teaching our kids. Um, so yeah, moving on to social media questions, uh, we got a few, uh, but they sort of revolved around two key themes. So I sort of compressed them. Um, and, uh, you touched upon them in your conversation, but if some all those who ask might want to see them addressed separately as well. So one question is, if, uh, I think they sort of miss, again, as the initial assumption was that it's an acceleration program. Um, other than you know doing the re, uh, research and sort of being prepared and reaching out to you with an actual uh, you know, concept or something, what else can somebody who is looking to collaborate with you can, you know, sort of maybe work on? 
Um, so I think, uh, you know, do what you're doing <laughs> and uh, reach out and let's see how we can collaborate. I mean, I can say a few things, for example, right now, in addition to circular economy and plastic waste, uh, of course, if you're doing something interesting in that sphere, please contact us. Um, and we also are now uh, developing a new portfolio on digital transformation with the government uh, and uh, NADRA. And so if you have uh, solutions like e-payments or citizen-focused services that you've been prototyping, reach out again on, on, on that. Show us your solutions and we could uh, feature, feature that either in our webinar or see if we can work together. Um, and, you know, tag us, just keep, keep in touch on social media, tag us on that. And then also on UNDP's procurement website, we often have uh, tender notices or innovation challenges. Uh, so please um, keep a lookout for that. And when they are published, apply. Um, it's when when UNDP actually publishes a vacancy or a tender like that, it's easier. Uh, then there's a formal process to work together on. Um, so often what happens is sometimes the ideas are simply not aligned uh, to the priorities of UNDP. And as much as we would love to work together, it's sometimes just impossible to make that happen. Um, so just to bear that in mind. And then um, host, host webinars also. Zoom has, this is amazing on uh, social media. We can have conversations. I prefer this so much because so many people can tune in. So host them, invite us over. Uh, it's not just me, you can contact the rest of my team. Um, we can understand each other and have a conversation and uh, build partnerships from there too. Um, so yeah, this is the last question and this sort of focuses on the idea of mentoring because um, I think and this is what I've seen as well, having talked to so many startups at this point. Um, they have ideas, they have, you know, the concepts, they are very strong as far as the technical front is concerned. But, you know, getting, seeing a startup from an idea to actually a practical product or service and, you know, building it into a business model or, you know, an actual workable practical thing requires a lot of other aspects uh, of a business model as well, not just the technical side. So, and there is a lot of uh, lack of mentoring at every level because be it school, be it whatever you want to call it. And so a lot of these startups, when they're in the initial phase, actually are looking for mentors. So this was also, this was, a, the, we had a few questions that are sort of were hinting at this key idea that if somebody ends up working with you guys, and I know you are not a typical incubator or accelerator, but if, if somebody has a solid idea and they're technically very, very strong, uh, is there a way that while they're working with you, they, they can have that sort of mentorship where they can develop the rest of the required skills? So we have an internship program that runs for six months and um, we just, we literally just closed our, our last advertisement, but we will run it now after six months next year. Um, and on my team, uh, along with everybody else, um, it's very important that the ideas that we have, um, the team is given that support to execute it. Um, and given, so within the team, there's a lot of mentoring um, and, and coaching. Uh, and not just from me, but also from each members of the team to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and with our interns, you know, I and, and you know, we also have a, a United Nations volunteer with us, and um, we really encourage uh, if you have something you're very interested in, let's work on that. You know, because ultimately, you are going to you should work on your strengths. You should know what your strengths are. You should know what your value is. And 
also and be aware of what you're not good at you know this is very important um often we enter the work world the entrepreneur world and not know that some things we're not good at and how do we address them sometimes we get so focused on improving them uh not realizing that hey you know maybe you can partner up with someone who can take over that work like I don't like to do operations work. I'm I'm it's not my not my world. I can oversee it. So I've learned I can oversee it, but I need help, you know. Somebody else needs to take care of this. And so that's how we organize our work. Um so if you were to join my team as an intern or a consultant, um then yes, you would get mentoring and coaching within uh the team. um and and i you know and for me young women especially i mean i am a little biased but like young women and supporting them for leadership roles is extremely important because that doesn't exist as such uh it's a few role models around um so i take a lot of care about that um and i always like the interns i've just had they were both young women and i said i'm here to be your reference and here is you know, here are some things you can think about and they contact me you know sometimes to ask for career advice as an implementing partner as a startup then of course we are now hiring you for a for a skill uh, so there might not be any pressure for that but in general like i would also advise if you know in so i wouldn't call myself an entrepreneur i'll call myself an intrapreneur mm-hmm. <laughs> and our lab within UNDP is like a startup you know uh we have to turn this from nothing to something and create our value in an organization that employs 20,000 people globally you know and amongst 90 labs uh so we have to like have our value understood and just a word of experience advice or whatever you want to to call it i i just feel everyone has good ideas you know having good ideas is not the problem um it's how the skill is how you get it done and the only space you will find how to get it done is not to go in with all or nothing kind of negotiating skills it's collaborative um you know there's um i'm sure your community knows of adam grant in one of his podcasts he talks about creative negotiations you know which is all about collaborating which is all about meeting people halfway you know um you know even game theory at the end of the day is yeah. it, it it comes down to collaboration you no one wins all so i see a lot of people suffering there this translates into working within a team how you lead the team how you work in partnerships i think always trying to find a way that everyone wins and not having an ego about this like put your ego away be humble there's no need uh <laughs> to show who you are you know the result is in the big picture and do that in collaboration and that's the space i would always tell everyone to work in because i have seen from like totally new graduates to like extremely senior people fail and not get things done because people just don't want to work with them and they just don't want to like they just don't like them you know and that's that's a big deal you should be likable it doesn't mean be nice and be a pushover it means be firm be humble and uh that should be uh, a way that you can get things done yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you and uh, i think you wrapped up pretty nicely and this was a good piece of advice for all those listening uh thank you for your time and this is some very, really interesting work that you are doing and hopefully we'll have you back uh with some other project and whatever you want to share uh we would really be interested in you know once you have something a project that has been out there we would like to have maybe those other 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 team members who are involved in them come on board and share their experience as well uh, so until next time thank you and goodbye thank you so much it was a pleasure thank you for talking with me